Hi, I'm Jeff Garrett, and it's the 30th of April after the last session of our epidemics class. And it's my pleasure to be joined by Professor Beth Simmons. Beth is a Penn Integrates Knowledge University professor at Penn with appointments not only in the Wharton School, but in political science and in the law school. And Beth is an expert, maybe the expert on borders. Nice to see you, Beth. Nice to see you too. Thank you. So yesterday you showed some dramatic evidence that despite the globalization of our world and the notion that we've become borderless, in fact, in the past decade or so, there's been a real building up of physical borders. Could you talk just a little bit about what's happened? What's happened and that we're able to document using a range of technologies, we've made really good use of Google Earth, for example, is that you can literally see on the ground the uh, growing presence of states fortifying. I, it's a word I kind of use loosely. These are not all fortifications, but building up architectural features of the state on the border to exert their authority there. And uh, we can see these things in virtually every region of the world, uh, and they take a number of forms. They take the form of fences and walls, as we've had clearly had a debate on that in the United States, but they also take the form of border crossing um, buildings, inspection stations, barriers across the road that can move. Uh, they take the form as well of, as enhanced police presence in border zones. Uh, and all these things tend to have been increasing over time. In every part of the world, though, in some parts of the world from a low level, the United but, States but I think you I, I think you you noticed that or you sh showed us all that the harder borders or the borderfication has tended to be harder when you've got a, a dramatic change in um, in economic stage of development. So in particular, going from a highly developed economy to a less developed one, borders tend to be tougher. US Mexico is an obvious example, but there, but there are some others in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. is, is that true that there's, there's, there's an economic disparity element to this new borders phenomenon? That's actually one of the clearest things that our data does suggest. So when we run analyses, statistical analyses, that look at the uh, thickness of the border as, as the phenomenon to be explained, we're finding very convincing evidence that even when you control for a host of other factors, most importantly, the wealth of the building nation itself, the disparity with the neighbor also clearly predicts that there will be a border buildup as well. Okay, so what's been going on? Um, if we think about the last 10 years, we had a rise of kind of anti-globalization sentiment. We obviously had a profound financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and at more or less the same time, we saw a rise of populism. I mean, the Tea Party in the US, but obviously in Western Europe and around the world as well. Um, if you had to sort of apportion causal weight to why borders have thickened, uh, how would you score it? I'm going to resist a little bit the premise of the question, and that is that it's possible really to apportion these out because I see these as all related developments. And I think if I had to choose a word that uh, ties them all together, it's a sense of growing vulnerability to external forces that are very hard to control. And it seems to me that um, despite all of the complaints that people have against their governments and their states, that they frequently turn to the state to protect themselves against outside forces. The great, um, sometimes unobservable other uh, that is very hard to name, but is somehow threatening my job, threatening my neighborhood, and threatening my health. And uh, when there's this sort of sense of growing threat, which can be intensified, by um, import penetration into areas that used to produce particular goods can be uh, intensified by the arrival of different groups uh, that don't share some of the same cultural characteristics uh, and certainly can be intensified by um, the sense of our health may be at stake by what may be coming across the border. The people turn to their uh, governments for assistance and some 
some particular politicians can help to enhance those fears and intensify those fears by using sorts of rhetoric that inflame them rather than tamp them down or reassure. And it seems to me that hardening borders and a related phenomenon, which is sort of blaming outsiders and outside forces for internal problems, uh, is um, one clear tactic that uh, some leaders have taken to um, create a demand for further bordification. I like the way you use that word, bordification. Uh, but this ties together the themes that uh, you mentioned. It's um, themes of anti-globalization, uh, themes of vulnerability, uh, which were accelerated by the global financial crisis. Uh, and that leads to uh, choices that are more populist. And these populist choices of leaders then can reinforce some of this rhetoric and are um, often connected with um, enhancing state strength at the border as part of their um, sort of uh, their symbol, if you will, uh, for achieving something to protect people. One of the things we found actually in the data uh, for countries that uh, um, we can find data on populist rhetoric, uh, that rhetoric of leaders uh, is clearly co correlated anyway, causal. I mean, these are mutually reinforcing issues, of course. They're correlated clearly with the measures that we have of thickening borders. So populism so of that, and thickening uh, borders are true. correlated. Yeah, so all of that's clearly true right now. And, you know, another word that I know you've used in some other publications is anxiety. Uh, you know, a, a profoundly psychological term. You, you showed some examples of, you know, extreme border measures in prior pandemics, um, including within countries, right? We tend to think about these borders as at the country's edge, but um, we, we have, we've had experience before and we're seeing uh, efforts again at borders within countries. So what have you learned about borders and pandemics uh, from history? Yeah. Well, one thing is clear is that um, bordering a community against pandemics actually precedes the formation of states. So I wonder, and I'll just sort of throw this idea out, I have no idea whether the idea of defending a community against outside threat doesn't depend on a state. It depends on um, almost some some something almost primordial in some sense that we need to protect ourselves against some kind of an unknown from the outside. Um, and so over history, you see this rather repeatedly. So for example, um, the Black Death in Europe, uh, communities, city-states uh, were in the business essentially of creating cordons around population centers uh, in ways that tried to exclude uh, incoming traders and incoming uh, persons that would be moving in and out, uh, non-citizens, if you will. Uh, and uh, we've seen it again, essentially, many, many times, sometimes at the subnational level, uh, even in the United States. So the yellow fever epidemics that would come seasonally in uh, the southern United States and Florida, for example, um, created tensions because a lot of the local communities, Jacksonville, Florida, as an example, uh, were intent on creating armed boundaries around their community quite against the wishes of the entire state of Florida. Um, so communities at the very local level have taken these kinds of actions. And then certainly we have seen in the current situation, you know, some states wanting to keep their neighbors from New York from traveling into their jurisdictions and have placed state troopers on the road to question people with New York plates. So it seems to me that uh, there are many examples that efforts have been made. How successful? I think that uh, there are some lessons uh, from more recent instances than any of these that we could discuss uh, that indicate that only on a very narrow set of circumstances are travel restrictions very effective. So, so, Beth, let's talk a little bit about uh, the pragmatic realities of administering borders. And I thought you, you had some really interesting things to say about borders as more now than citizen checks and how well borders are equipped to play this broader role and the difference between kinds of borders. So you were making the point that airports are incredibly important, but airports don't want to appear 
fierce. They want to appear friendly. So how, how are we going to administer borders in this complex age now where, where global public health issues are at least as important as what your passport says? Yeah, I think uh, one thing to, that is sort of a little bit of a preface to this answer is that some borders are meant to appear friendly. Airports are that. And some borders are specifically meant to appear fierce. Uh, and they have a very clear deterrent, of, uh, deterrent purpose behind them to warn people that they will not get across, that they will not be welcome, that they will be turned back. Uh, and so it's essentially a waste of time to attempt to cross into another country. So that, and just for starters, let's recognize that some borders, this is a, a highly stratified space, essentially. Some borders that privilege the wealthy want to appear friendly, and others uh, that are um, sites for the crossing of the more the poorer people and more vulnerable people um, are sometimes have this kind of deterrent kind of quality to them. So, in terms of administering borders themselves. Uh, these are places where I guess we can we can think of these as kind of filtering stations, if you want to think of it that way. These are places where states implement the technology, the techniques, um, the observational equipment, to the monitoring to only let in who they want under the circumstances that they want to let them in. Um, so a bordering borders are locations for accomplishing this kind of filtering activity. And that activity can include trying to um, find out where people have been, what kind of path of movement they've taken, and from that be able to infer what kind of risk risk they may pose uh, within a polity, whether they have some, if, whether there's evidence of having a terrorist connection or whether there's evidence that they've been in an area of pandemic. But these are places uh, where efforts are made to uh, essentially to filter. And part of that filtering is information gathering at the border. Increasingly, uh, the weapon of choice in terms of trying to control international threats are databases databases of persons who are under suspicion. So my last question is a much bigger picture one, and I think it's a poignant one for both of us. You know, we've, we've spent our academic lives thinking about the internationalization of the world, right? The globalization, it really began in 1980, 1985. Um, do you think that, that it, we've had peak globalization and we're now going to be in a deglobalizing era, or is this, is in in hindsight, is this going to look more like a blip than a secular change? I can only speculate, and I am not any better to equ better equipped than any anybody else who generally studies these areas to speculate in a very. Um, uh, in a very insightful way. But it seems to me that there are some features of the current pushback against globalization that are kind of going to be difficult to reverse. And one of them, if I, I guess I want to sort of characterize um, some of the regulations that constitute a pushback against globalization are sort of like um, a buildup of the clogging of the arteries uh, in in a, a vascular system. And it's hard to unclog arteries, if you will, uh, once demands have been put into place to slow down movement. It's hard to do that. Uh, and, and the reason it's hard in a political setting, in a body politic, and in, in an international body politic, is that, again, some people have a preference um, for exclusion and othering. Again, we can go back to that sort of sense of threat and vulnerability. And so the kinds of restrictions that may be put into place um, in the name of containing uh, pandemics, for example, are very easily spill over into restrictions on immigration, migration, the rights of refugees, and can also, of course, spill over into areas having to do with international trade. Uh, and the restriction of trade relationships between countries, which might be done in the name of uh, in the name of pandemics, but may stick uh, because uh, there are powerful groups that uh, gain 
from these kinds of restrictions being put into place. Combining that with uh, national slogans, I think, is going to make it uh, very difficult in some ways to um, kind of re-energize the globalization movement. And then it can be connected to all um, kinds of other fears. Is it safe to travel? And so even people who demand globalization and want globalization are at least uh, in the medium term going to be a, a bit haunted by the safety of traveling and breathing recirculated air over and over again in an airplane. So I think that some of the uh, forces, some of the, uh, I think some of the uh, forces at play are going to make it very, very difficult to reconnect. And and part of it is the kind of kind of rush to our nationalisms again, and to our state uh, as sort of the guarantor of our well-being, not the WTO, uh, not the WTO, not the WHO, not the European Union. Uh, none of the above. Uh, when it comes to uh, confidence that uh, um, that uh, our in, that, that that the citizens' interests will be protected, I think um, a lot of people are sort of flocking back to their states and pushing it back against these broader cooperative organizations and efforts. I bet that's a, a fantastic tie-in and a fantastic place for us to end this interview. Uh, thanks for your class yesterday. Thanks for the interview today. I certainly really appreciate it.